Frequency Podcast Network. Stories that matter, podcasts that resonate. It's been a year full of labor unrest in the transportation industry. But this one has the potential to top them all. Air Canada is finalizing plans to suspend several flights as soon as Sunday. The decision was made to cancel most of the operations in preparation of a potential pilot strike. The deadline for an Air Canada pilot strike is not for another week. But already, passengers are scrambling to rebook flights, and the airline is saying that it may start cancelling flights as early as this weekend, days ahead of the strike deadline. Why so early? Well, maybe they remember when their competitor WestJet went through the same thing earlier this year. It didn't go so well. I'm hanging in in nowhere right now um, with two boys. Um, we don't know what to do, and um, yeah, Germany's on the other side from the planet. So now Air Canada is much much bigger than WestJet. It's the largest carrier in the country by a mile. Tens of thousands of people fly every day on their planes. What happens when those planes just don't fly? And why has this year seen so many transport disruptions? On rails, in airports, and at ports in Canada and the United States. What's changed? I'm Jordan Heath Rawlings. This is The Big Story. John Graddick is an aviation industry expert. He is a faculty lecturer and program coordinator in supply chain logistics and operations management at McGill University. He joins us from the side of the road in his car. He's one of our favorite people to talk to when uh, transportation in this country is in danger of breaking down, John. <laughs> My pleasure to be here with you, Jordan. Why don't you set us up by giving us a bit of context about Air Canada as everybody frets about a possible upcoming work stoppage? Like, what percentage of Canada's airline travel, airline industry uh, does this company make up? I'd say Air Canada is about 40 to 45 percent of the Canadian aviation capacity. You know, it's number one by a fair degree. Number two is WestJet. Number three, probably Porter Airlines at this point in time. And then Flair holding up the uh, the uh, the top four. If I had to ask you just off the top, and we'll get into the details of it, um, to describe what kind of problem uh, an Air Canada shutdown would cause in Canada, what would you describe it as? Oh, I'd say it's major. It's a it's a it's an inconvenience. It would be something where you have, I would say, somewhere in the range of a hundred to one hundred and ten thousand passengers a day that have trips planned on Air Canada. So it's not insignificant. It is something that those passengers who are booked on Air Canada have a high level of anxiety today. They're probably getting emails and messages from Air Canada because Air Canada has already started to look at uh, potentially canceling flights in preparation for a strike. So they're getting emails advising them, here are your options. Your flight's probably going to get canceled. We don't know when. But here are some of the options to be available, and we'll let you know if and when the flights actually do get canceled. You mentioned 100 to 110,000 people a day. Um, in terms of the Air Canada workforce themselves, how many workers are we talking about here? And uh, if you can, summarize for us what the issues are here uh, that's threatening a strike. Well, I think what, what you're seeing happen here is, you know, one group of employees, which are the pilots, that have uh, a new union that's representing them. They, they turf the uh, the previous union, which was the Air Canada Pilots Association. So this is a new union that's representing these pilots. There are 5,200 pilots. If the pilots you know, are on strike, for all intents and purposes, Air Canada is shut down. What happens to the rest of the workers at Air Canada if the pilots go on strike? Are they still getting paid? What are they doing? Yeah, Air Canada is going to be looking at taking some layoff notices fairly quickly to the other unionized employees that are part of their um, operations branch. So you've got flight attendants, you've got mechanics, you've got ground service workers. So if the flights aren't going, Air Canada will be looking at somehow minimizing its costs and and looking to see if they can, in fact, put these individuals on layoff status pending the resolution of this strike or lockout that they may have with with the pilots. 
So the deadline uh, for this labor dispute is the 18th of September, which is still a week away here. So why are, as you mentioned, people already hearing about their flights potentially being canceled as early as this weekend and being told to make arrangements now? Like, this is a, a fair buffer usually for a labor dispute. It is. I think that, you know, we saw this same phenomenon happen with the Westhead labor issues that they were having with their pilots earlier this year, where WestJet, in fact, took action, I think, three or four days before the actual threat of a strike to, in fact, start canceling flights in anticipation of a strike, uh, because you're looking at, you know, trying to make sure that your, uh, your operations, you know, and your flights, your aircraft and your staff are not stranded. So when you've had the airplanes that are going around the world, as Air Canada has, you're looking at making sure that if, it, when, if and when the strike does happen, that uh, the airplanes and the crews are in a secure location. And so if there's a issue about location that's causing Air Canada grief, Air Canada would, in fact, not dispatch an airplane to those locations uh, a few days before the strike actually happens so that people are not stranded and the equipment is not stranded. So this is where it gets interesting, and this is why uh, we called you, because that process sounds really complex. Can you kind of walk us through the actual logistics of shutting down, like, the entire Air Canada operation? Uh, what does that look like on the ground in practice? Yeah, it is it is complex. You know, you, you basically have to look at each and every single flight that, you know, is scheduled to operate, you know, as of the strike date, September 18th, which is the tentative date that Air Canada has set. So anything that's operating, it's in the air uh, as of that time, will get to land wherever they happen to be the first stop for that aircraft to land. So there's no risk to the passengers uh, or the airplanes when the strike gets called. But once the airplane lands, the pilots walk off. And from that perspective, you'd rather have these pilots walk off at their home base. You'd rather, you know, you're not, you'd rather not have these pilots walk off in Dubai or in Singapore or in Bangkok, or you know, in Casablanca. So Air Canada is looking at what's it going to take for us to make sure that by the time we get to a potential lockout or strike on the 1st of September, you know, what's the, what's, where are our people? Where are our airplanes? And you know, what is it that we have to do to make sure that when the strike or lockout does happen, they're safe? And so that will require the airline to cancel flights that are planned to operate before the strike or lockout date and to make sure that that operation, that air flight, that flight, and that those crews are not sent out on their mission because the odds of them making it back are not good. Let's talk about what passengers are experiencing. As you mentioned right now, you know, they're probably getting emails about a potential cancellation of their flight Uh, in a couple of days. Even they could start getting emails that their flight has been canceled. What options do they have and like what kind of uh, compensation are they entitled to here if this goes down? Firecat has been very, very uh, upfront in telling passengers that once your flight is canceled, you know, you have options, including refunds. So Air Canada will look at refunding your your ticket uh, once a flight has been declared canceled and you're on your own. After that, if you have a trip that was planned, there is no uh, requirement by Air Canada to, in fact, book you uh, on another flight. You have to fend for yourself in making sure that you have, you know, your 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 trip protected on your own. So they got to go and look for another airline themselves and then pay for that ticket themselves as well. That's correct. You know, the question is, how fast is Air Canada going to refund you? Right. Am I going to wait six months to get a refund or am I going to get the refund in 10 or 15 days? You know, that's an interesting question that has yet to be answered by Air Canada. But, you know, in terms of other compensation, we have the air passenger protection rights that are out there that do cover flights that are delayed or canceled. In you know, in normal operations during the schedule, and there is compensation. You know, if the flight is canceled and it's out of the airline's control, there is no compensation. But in this case, I think Air Canada and the Canadian Transportation Agency have concluded that this is an event that is outside the airline's control, and that uh, there would be no compensation provided by the carriers other than just a refund of the ticket. 
And what about the rest of, and I'm assuming this is covered by what you just mentioned, but I got to ask it because uh, I know a lot of people, and I've heard this mentioned, a uh, book, Holiday Packages, right? That include your Air Canada flight, but also uh, lock you into a hotel or a rental car or whatever else it is. People are just on the hook for those. You know, one of the things we've been always talking about in the industry is to ensure that you, when you buy these these packages or these tours that you also buy insurance. The insurance uh, side of it, you know, is basically your your protection for this type of eventuality. You know, as long as your insurance policy has coverage for it. But, you know, that's probably the only saving grace um, that you'll get out of this one is to look for insurance coverages. You mentioned the WestJet strike, and I know that lasted like just a couple of days, but it still managed to shut down a ton of flights and strand people in Canada and other countries. Do you think there were lessons learned from that that Air Canada will use now? Well, I think what you see happening with Air Canada is a little different than what happened with WestJet, is that Air Canada has taken the initiative to let passengers know that, you know, there is a potential for disruption, that, you know, there is something that's that's going to be sent to you uh, at the time of a cancellation. Uh, it's it's like the cancellations are not going to be a surprise. That uh, you know you, you should expect communication from Air Canada, and I think that whole process is a little different than what we had when WestJet uh, was going through its machinations with its pilots. So I think Air Canada has learned a lesson from the WestJet fiasco and has met, is trying to manage it a little differently. I'm not sure whether, in fact, Air Canada, you know, is is looking at a strike or is looking at a lockout. Uh, I'm not sure how that's all going to work out. But, yeah, there there has been lessons learned. I think Air Canada, Air Canada is applying it. In general, why has there been so much labor unrest in the airline industry specifically, uh, but also just in transportation uh, in general? You know, we saw a, a rail uh, work action uh, just a few weeks ago. Yeah, I think this is a situation of Air Canada's own design. You know, Air Canada back in the mid-2010s, 2013, 2014, uh, had some issues with respect to its financial viability. And they decided one of their answers as was to, in fact, go into these long-term contracts with their employee groups so that they would minimize any disruption to the airline. So they entered into 10-year contracts in, 10, in 2014 with the pilots, uh, in 2015 with the flight attendants, and uh, the price they paid was labor peace for 10 years. Now the crows have come home to roost and <laughs> you're paying a price for that 10 year contract now. And so that's what's going on with Air Canada that, you know, would they repeat this 10 year contract deal again? I don't think so. I think the unions kind of got their lesson, talk to them and Air Canada as well. So I think that we've seen the last of these long, long term agreements. Uh, we're back to a three or four year agreement if, at, at, at the most. And that should, you know, come up with fixing the problem with the airline industry. But transportation in general, um, you know, is having a problem. You know, there, there's a lot of things going on in transportation in terms of collective agreements that are expiring. People have gone through COVID, have gone through layoffs, have gone through salary freezes, salary reductions. And the industry across various modes are looking to catch up. So whether you're talking about the BC port strike, the Montreal port strike, you're talking about CN, CPKC, you're talking about WestJet, you're talking about Air Canada, even talking Air Transat. You know, transportation seems to be in the in the in the in the bullseye for organized labor to kind of catch up on on wages and to make sure that you know they people understand that they are an integral part of the supply chain. The supply chains are important to keep economic stability in our country, and the unions are taking advantage of that. But it's not just in Canada. The U.S. East, East Coast ports uh, are facing a, a strike on October 1st that would shut down 77 ports in the U.S. And the, um, you know, the provision for those ports is that they're looking for, a, are you sitting down? 77% wage increase. Wow. So, yeah, they, they we're all catching up. And I think that there's a lot of work that has to be done to kind of press the reset button in terms of making sure we, we somehow have labor peace and that we have collective agreements that reflect the, the actual needs of organized labor as well as uh, the operators. Is part of this because um, 
you know, they're pressing their advantage because during COVID, I think the general public learned a lot more rapidly about how uh, integral these folks are to the supply chain and the transportation chain. And now, you know, the public has a better understanding of uh, where they fit into all this. Yeah, there is. And, you know, I think that, you know, we go back to the pilots for a few minutes and just talk about, you know, how this thing kind of got to where it's at. You know, there is a pilot shortage in North America. I would say I would say even globally. You know, the manufacturers are producing tons and tons, you know, thousands of airplanes and not, there's not enough pilots to, to get these airplanes flying. So the larger carriers are very concerned about in, in, about getting their pilot resources and retaining the pilot resources they need. And their answer uh, has been to increase wages and to pay, pay and to pay more than anybody else so that they have the ability to retain their their pilots in this case. So Delta, American, you know, United uh, signed massive wage increases over the last 18 to 24 months, ranging from 35 to 45 percent wage increases as a means of retaining people, retaining pilots. And that has a cascading effect. And we're seeing that cascading effect very much both in the WestJet negotiations earlier this year and and very much so now with Air Canada. When we talk about Air Canada, if this uh, strike happens, is there a role for the government to play here? I realize that's a kind of a delicate question to ask, but obviously it is a huge part of the infrastructure. You mentioned almost 50 percent of our airline capacity. Yeah, it's an issue that we have to somehow deal with. Um, you know, the question is, you know, what's the what's the government's role in in labor negotiations and in collective bargaining? What I see happening is that there seems to be, in my opinion, you know, an abdication on the part of management to be willing to negotiate because they know that the government will step in and will, in fact, take action, in, you know, in spite of the fact that negotiations have been slow. So we saw that with, with the WestJet pilots. We saw that most definitively with the WestJet mechanics. Very obvious with the rail strike that, you know, there was in my opinion, an abdication of willingness to negotiate on the part of management. And they're saying, well, this doesn't really matter. We're going to get them, we're going to get either binding arbitration or back to work legislation. So let's not sweat it. You know, we'll get a public outcry. So, you know, the, the country was in crisis, economic crisis with a real strike. And the government took action 18 hours after the strike was launched. It was over. But with Air Canada, there is no economic urgency. There is no national emergency. There is no crisis that we have to deal with because we do have competition, thank you very much, in Canada that, you know, have flying 200 some odd airplanes. And as far as I'm concerned, there is going to be inconvenience for sure. You know, those 110,000 passengers a day are going to get inconvenienced and it's going to cost them more. But that's the game that are being, that's being played between management and union. And Air Canada is not recognizing, you know, its need to to ante up to to meet the union requirements because they're saying that government's going to legislate us back to work anyway. So no big deal. If this strike does happen and continues for some time, like, you know, you mentioned again, 100,000 people a day. How does that compound day after day? I mean, we saw WestJet, which didn't even really have a work stoppage, still took like a couple of weeks to get back up to full strength. Like what kind of... uh, I don't know if chaos is the right term, but what kind of mess would it cause if this strike happens and goes for a week and then continues? Yeah, you know, I'll use the term chaos. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) It is going to be chaos, you know, and it's going to take at least a couple of weeks for Canada to get back into some shape or form of current self. It's going to take them a couple of weeks to get their act together. The other carriers in Canada will try as much as they can to supplement their services, but uh, it's going to take at least 10 days to two weeks to come back. Last question then, uh, what do you wish uh, we all understood better, the public understood better about this whole uh, labor issue in the airline industry or with Air Canada in particular? What do we not know that we need to? This is a, an issue uh, in transportation that uh, has been, you know, on the back burner for, for years, if not decades, that, you know, who has control of the destiny of, you know, employees in the airline industry? And it is a fundamental issue that I think Air Canada and the unions are coming to to grips with. That, you know, when you talk about who has the final say in terms of making sure that workers' rights 
uh, are being recognized and being acted upon. And I think that that's where we have to somehow, some way, really change our labor relations practices and our you know labor negotiation practices to recognize that you know the conundrum that we're facing in Canada uh, in transportation is serious. That you know the collective bargaining process that we have probably needs to get retuned to something else. The current process isn't working, as we can see in various domains, but we do need to have somehow, some way recognition that supply chains uh, are very, very critical to the success of the country. We can't afford to have all of these supply chain interruptions happen because it affects our credibility in, in world trade. So we need a new mechanism uh, to kind of figure out how do we negotiate without causing all of this chaos, as we say, in the supply chains and in air transportation. John, thank you so much for this. And speaking of transportation chaos, I will let you get back in your car before you get pulled over by the cops. And thanks again for spending some time with us. I think they called for a tow truck, which is cool. All right. No, I'll be okay. <laughs> Take care. Have a good one. John Graddock of McGill University, hopefully not getting a ticket right now. That was The Big Story. For more from us, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always shoot us your feedback on this episode or any other by emailing hello at thebigstorypodcast.ca or by calling us 416-935-5935 is the number and leaving us a message. The Big Story is available on every single podcast player in the world, and that now includes Seeker, S-E-E-K-R. You should check it out if you haven't. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.